Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Dan, and I'm a recovered alcoholic who by the grace of God and with the help of Alcoholics Anonymous can tell you that I had my last drink and my last chemical fix sometime in the month of October of 1947. And now that I've told you a little bit about myself and I intend to tell you a lot more before we're finished this evening, I'd like to know a little bit about you. I was in marketing all my life, and I'm used to taking surveys, and I feel like uh, that's the natural thing for me to do up here. I would like to see if I can, and I don't mean to embarrass anyone, so you don't, you can completely disregard me if you want to, but I'd like to see the hands of all of the people in this group who are 42 years of age or younger. Now remember, this is an honest program. Thank you very much. So you see, perhaps I have been sober more years than you have been alive. And so before you say, what in the hell is that old fart doing up there? How could I possibly relate to him? Uh, what could he have? What would he know about my problems? Let me say to you that it has been my experience, and I understand full well, and I think perhaps you can, that if we are alcoholics of the same kind, I'm talking about the third chapter variety, if we are alcoholics of the same kind, then alcohol did the same things to us. Even though I drank at a different time and place than you did, I perhaps, and I think I did, come to a somewhat different Alcoholics Anonymous than you did. Again, if we are alcoholics of the same kind, alcohol did the same thing to us, AA is doing the same thing for us, or we wouldn't all be here. Have you had a good time today? I heard it has been a very successful meeting, and I am certainly, I was sure that it would, because I got acquainted with the committee that was putting this thing on, and uh, I want to take the place and time right now before I forget, because I sometimes do. I'd like to thank Sam. I'd like to thank Al. I would particularly like to thank Tom. I'd like to thank all of those on the committee that had anything to do with this. I think, I'm sure they did a good job, because... I thought they used such good choice in choosing their speaker. <laughs> I thought that would probably... <laughs> you understand, I tell you that with all my humility. Since it is an honest program, and God, I hate to do this, but I've got to tell you, a past delegate, yes. Past trustee, no. My service in Alcoholics Anonymous began very early. At another time and place, I can tell you more about that. But it ended so far as those appointed or elected positions in AA when I completed my service as a delegate from the state of Nevada to the Seventh Conference. Now, I have been quite sure that one day the error would be corrected and they would see the error of their ways and I would be again called upon to be uh, a trustee, but that hasn't happened yet and we'll just wait till it does. Uh, it, it, it's also like the letter that... Uh, I was sure that I was always going to get from New York authorizing me 
uh, whenever I appeared on podiums like this uh, to speak for Alcoholics Anonymous. But somehow it never came. And so you must understand that tonight what I'm going to tell you, I'm speaking only for myself, not for Alcoholics Anonymous. And I hope that I can keep my remarks uh, to the things that I learned in the only book that I know of, or at least the book that is the last authority that I know of on the disease and the solution to alcoholism. This is it. It may not look like your book, but you haven't been where it has. We've been a lot of places together, and both of us show our wear and tear a little. I'm sure the book far more than I, but anyway, I'm going to try to tell you about that. I also, before we go any further, for my satisfaction, and since I wasn't here all day, I would like to see, I wonder if all of the people who are attending as GSRs the first conference in their life would stand up. But you GSRs are your first. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the hand for them. I think they surely have it coming. I don't know how you got into service. I didn't have any choice. I was told. But it's the least rewarding thing I did, but I wouldn't undo any bit of it, and I hope that you don't. You've heard about the miracles of Alcoholics Anonymous. I see one every morning in the mirror. But there's lots of other miracles in Alcoholics Anonymous. Let me tell you a little bit. When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was 35 years of age. And I was a helpless, hopeless, sick alcoholic. And at least two-thirds of the people in that group that I came to did not believe that anyone who still had their own teeth and a hockable watch could possibly be ready to quit drinking. But I was 35 years of age. In 1982, I celebrated 35 years of sobriety. And it became so clear to me it was one of the real great anniversaries. Because you see, I see now that I had lived a full life, a life that was full of a lot of pain and a lot of confusion and not very pleasant. So I had lived a whole life by the time I got here. In 1982, I had completed a whole second life, sober, happy, joyous, free, as long as the years that I'd had when I got here. And I took a look at the future and I wondered. And I said, well, hell, it's evident. I lived one life, now I've lived the second, I'm just starting the third. And there was a lady in my life by that time, and I discussed this with her. She was celebrating, I think, her 10th year of sobriety that year. We, she decided, she decided, this beautiful lady agreed to start this third life with me. Boy, oh boy, you don't know about the miracles of AA till you stay around a while. This beautiful lady, some of you here know her, but I want all of you to. Here's a lady with the patience of Job. She follows me around at these meetings and listens to this story over and over again. If I suddenly lost my voice, she could get up here and tell it better than I can. <laughs> I've never caught her asleep during one of these discussions. 
She's a wonderful audience, and I always ask her to sit right down in front where I can see her when I feel the hostility starting up. <laughs> I'd like for all of you that don't know to meet my beautiful wife, Joanne. Joanne, would you? If general service hasn't got straightened out yet, it will. She's here. Look out. I've got a lot of friends here tonight, too. I call them my kids. It's a marvelous thing. They hear I'm going to talk someplace, and they show up. God, how good that is. For a long time, I thought they were coming because they wanted to continue to hear what I had to say. I found out they're only here to support her to try to keep me honest. <laughs> so that's why I had to tell you right off of the bat about this trustee business as much as I was enjoying it. This is probably the first time in 42 years that I ever came to a meeting 30 minutes early, and my God, it's a good thing I did. They had changed the time starting of it. <laughs> Imagine starting a meeting without me. What happened was, if you haven't heard, I didn't hear anybody make any explanation of it. What happened was when those people who know me saw who the speaker was here tonight, they suggested that since this hall was only paid for till midnight, that they better start the meeting at 8 o'clock because they said they're going to need 30 minutes to clean it up before they get out. <laughs> I told you that I drank at a different time and place than you did. You see, I became an alcoholic. I drank alcohol alcoholically on illegal booze. And there probably isn't anybody in this room that ever had a drink of illegal booze, bootleg. I was addicted to the very first drink I took. They seem to think that was very rare in those days. It doesn't seem to be so rare today. But with the taking of the very first drink, it began, it, booze, alcohol, begin to take charge of my life, and I begin to forfeit and give my God-given freedoms. By the time that I reached Alcoholics Anonymous, any kind of a vision, of a goal, of a dream, even any ability to dream, had long since vanished because I had drunk alcoholically for 20 years. The last 10 years is what would be described today as a chronic alcoholic. There were days when I had to have a bottle of bootleg whiskey hid on the high school grounds to make it through the day. Any ability, any talent that I had ever had had been totally wasted by misuse. All individuality, all potential that I had had, and I had had some, had been given, sold, bartered for anything that looked like 24 hours of security. Any God-given dignity, all self-respect, had been totally corrupted by failure. 
at 35 years of age, I saw myself as a total failure. I sat there with my worldly possessions in a little brown paper sack, consisted of a safety razor, a toothbrush, and a pair of clean pair of socks. I think I had another pair of slacks perhaps hanging on a wire hanger in the restroom or kitchen of a bar. I had drunk up a loving family. I had drunk up a loving wife. I had drunk up two businesses of my own. I had drunk up so many jobs that out the very worst year of the Depression, when 30% of the working people in this country were out of work, I had 14 jobs in one 12-month period, been fired from every one of them three times from one. And it was not because I did not want to do something about my terrible condition. It was not because I didn't have a loving family that tried to help me. It was not because I wanted to be a failure. It was because the time and place. Now let's keep track with reality here. I'm talking about this century, not the Dark Ages. It was only the Dark Ages for an alcoholic. When I went to medicine, they said it was not anything they could do anything about. Psychiatry gave me the same answer, and when I went to religion, they told me I was a sinner. And where else was there to go? There was not a bed in this whole country, the most enlightened civilization that history has ever known. There was not a bed in a hospital for a sick alcoholic. Not a federal hospital, not a state hospital, not a county hospital, not a municipal hospital. There was not a bed. Not a charity hospital. There was not a bed. And many times I sobered up on the concrete floor of a gunk tank, clawing at that concrete trying to stay on this planet. Many times I sobered up in a straitjacket in a mental ward or a drug sanitarium. That's what that thing is that is described in this book in Bill's story. It was not a hospital. There wasn't such a thing. If you had enough influence, as I did and as Bill did, and if you had enough money and they had an empty bed and you were to the point of being in a straitjacket, they would sometimes put you there. And with what they called peraldehyde. They would try to bring you back to reality from your delirium, treatments, and convulsions. Now that's in this century, in this enlightened civilization. And somewhere else along the line, some terrible and strange things happened to me. Goodbye, old buddy. We'll see you another time. I had people that tried to help me. I had a friend that was a doctor. He said to me one time, Dan, I've watched you. I don't think you do the things to yourself that you do out of intent. And he said, you know, you remember my last year in medical school, how hard I was working and how tough it was. And he said there was a new medication that had come out about that time. And he said, I don't think I would ever have made it without this. And he said, I'm going to prescribe these for you. And when you feel you have to take a drink, I want you to take one of these instead as medication. Well, uh, I took them and bid him goodbye and, and kind of forgot about it. But in a day or two, I remembered it. And I remembered he said to take one, so I took two. And I found out uh, uh, that three was four times as good as two right away. And the very next thing I learned was that if you washed them down with a drink, they did have some value. <laughs> that was my introduction to amphetamines. And it was no time at all until I was carrying them loose in my pocket and popping them like peanuts with every drink I took.
Now, I had been pretty crazy before I found those. Now I think I was certifiably so. Because in about five years, this same doctor agreed to put me in touch with a doctor who had a hospital there in Missouri, he and his two sons. It wasn't called a hospital, it was called an insane asylum. And it was where they put the mentally deranged. And they took me there, and I had all the psychological tests and interviews and everything. And when they got finished, the most profound thing that had ever been said to me, they said, they said, we think you drink too much. My God Almighty, there wasn't anybody in this world that knew that as well as I did. They told me to go home. But I could be, or I could have been, or was a pretty persuasive fellow and pretty persistent. And I had been trying for a long time to get somebody to hear what, what was happening to me, see what we could do about it. And I persisted, and I think only out of courtesy to this doctor that took me there, they permitted me to make a 90-day self-commitment to this booby hatch. And after a few days there without anything, I mean anything, and I had been through my delirium treatments and a couple of convulsions, they decided maybe I was sicker than they had realized when I came there. And they began to take some notice of me. And wouldn't you know there had also just come a new medication on the market? of which they were aware, and they told me they thought it was going to be my salvation. And when I left that place, I had a bottle of the nastiest, god awfulest stuff you ever saw. I can taste it, I'm just telling you about it. It was red, and it looked like cough syrup, sodium barbitol. came only in liquid form. But I found... That if I took a drink of whiskey, took a bottle of whiskey, took a few drinks out of it, I could pour the sodium barbitol into the whiskey, and then it was palatable. And then when I took the little white jobs, incidentally, they were split in the middle. So you could take a half of one. Why the hell they ever did that, I'll never know. I never heard anybody take it. <laughs> But I popped a couple of these little white jobs and washed it down with a, this whiskey with a sodium barbitol in it. I had jet fuel before they had jets. <laughs> I had rocket fuel before rockets were ever invented. Reality was right here. And I would see it every time on the way up and on the way down. <laughs> But this self-propelled rocket did not have any controls. And I never could land that son of a bitch. It always crashed. <laughs> so you see, I drank at a different time and place than you did. But perhaps we have some things in common. You see, I drank illegal booze and never had an illegal or a street drug in my life. You never had an illegal drink, and you may never have had an illegal drug. But if we're alcoholics of the same kind, it did and does the same things to us. At 35 years of age, Alcoholics Anonymous found me. I weighed 114 pounds. I was beating in the palms of my hands and the soles of my feet. I told you a little more about me. The only place in the world I think that I could have found that would have taken me and could have saved my life. It's called the Shrine on the Hill in Kansas City, Kansas. And it's still in existence. It was started by a doctor who had been suspended from practicing medicine because of his alcoholism. He'd heard of a thing called Alcoholics Anonymous in a Saturday Evening Post article. And by the time I got there, a house had been donated to them, been made possible for them to have it. 
was a house in which Jean Harlow was raised by her grandparents because of her mother's alcoholism. And they had what they called a drying out place. The word detox wasn't even known. And I heard for the very first time in my life that I had a disease, that it was called alcoholism. I'd never heard the word in all of my searching, and that I was an alcoholic. They also told me that medicine had no understanding of this disease, and left to its own, it always, always, they said, ended in insanity and an alcoholic death. Incurable. Now, I don't know how that would have sounded to you, but it didn't sound too damn positive to me. <laughs> and then they showed me this book. And they showed me the foreword, the very first paragraph in the foreword. And it said, the purpose, the purpose of this book is to tell you how we, seemingly of a hopeless state of mind and body, have recovered. I found that positive. I wanted to know more. They showed me that there was a chapter on the solution preceding the chapter on the disease. I found that positive. They didn't talk to me about the Twelve Promises. I told you I came to a little different Alcoholics Anonymous, and perhaps you did. I'm not criticizing yours, but if anything that I heard at the Alcoholics Anonymous I came to can be of any service to you, then it's been worth the ride down here. They told me that I would find at least one promise on every page in the 169 pages of this book and that they were all kept if I could follow a few simple directions and take 12 steps. And they pointed out to me that they were numbered so that I could take them in order. They told me that this disease of mine was threefold. They told me it was physiological, psychological, and spiritual. And they showed it to me in print in this book. And then they told me if I could recover spiritually, I might recover physically and emotionally. They pointed out to me, they had me read it over and over again that I still had a choice. That astounded me as much as learning that I had a disease because this hopeless, helpless, sick alcoholic hadn't had a choice for years. Alcohol started making my choices with the first drink I took and I was addicted to the first drink just as I was addicted to the first speed pill I took, just as I was addicted to the first drink the first time I had sodium barbitol. I was proving 50 years ago what medicine is now telling us. My authority on this is Dr. Persh. If you don't recognize his name, he's the man that founded the Naval Program for Alcoholics. He's the man that ran the hospital in Long Beach where so many famous people went to that we read about in the papers. This man says that it is firm conviction from his experience that once an alcoholic is addicted to alcohol, he or she is immediately addicted to any other mood-altering chemical immediately that it's introduced into their system no matter how. I was proving that 50 years ago. They're learning. It takes a while, but they're learning. Thank God they are. 
Thank God no one has to go to the point I did. They said to me, and they showed me in print, and they had me read it many times, that I had this choice, that I had a choice between insanity and an alcoholic death and learning to live a life based on spiritual principles. It's there. It's right there. It says you will be reborn. It is called a spiritual awakening. That's why I could see that I had, there had been one entity the first 35 years, a second entity the next 35. Because I was able, by the grace of God, with the help of Alcoholics Anonymous, to find this book, to find this fellowship, to find a sponsor, and take these steps. I had a very difficult time. It was not easy for me. Because you see, the minute that I accepted the idea that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity, then they lowered the next one on me. They begin to talk about a power greater than myself, God, as I understood him. Now, I want to tell you for just a minute about God as I understood him. I had been born in a good Christian home. You've heard the story many times. I was the altar boy. I went to the Jesuit schools. I had all of the things that one should need to have. A good education as far as I could go with it before my choice left and my alcoholism took over. And the God I knew was a God that as a little boy, four or five years old, I had to have my ears washed twice, my fingernails clean, my pants pressed, a white shirt, a tie. And I had to be perfect before I could present myself to my God in God's house. And that's where God was. He was over here someplace. Please turn this cassette over to side two to continue with the program. the God I understood. I understood that this God was without limitation. There wasn't anything he couldn't do, and if I did enough good things for God, he might do something good for me. And that if I didn't, he might do some other things to me. I believed in a God. Who the hell do you think had brought all these terrible things on me? God had, of course. And they wanted me to turn this helpless, hopeless unmanageable life over to that. I said, no, thank you. I've had 35 years of that. I don't need any more. The sponsor said to me, Dan, I don't understand your God at all. I never heard about your God till I met you. I said, the God I know is a very loving God. It's a very forgiving God, a very compassionate God. And I wondered what kind of a fairy story he was talking about. But he persisted, and I kept getting sicker and hurting more. And I finally said to him, do you suppose I could borrow your God? He said, sure. The damn fool loaned it to me. And I took the third step with a borrowed God. And the strangest things begin to happen. Unbelievable things begin to happen because I had been able to make a deal. I began to be in the right place at the right time, and I couldn't possibly take any credit for it. I began to hear things that I needed to hear, and I wasn't even aware that I was listening. The right people began to come into my life, and it was unexplainable. I couldn't understand it. And what is more important, the wrong people begin to move out of my life. And my God, there was a lot of them. And it wasn't necessary for God or me to kill any of them. They just moved on, I'm sure, prospered wherever they went, and I was free of them. And so I want to say to you people who, like me, are having difficulty with the concept 
of God as you understand him. Let me tell you that I found, of all the beautiful words that I found in this book, in this text, in this set of directions, the most beautiful promise of all the promises here, said that a simple idea like making a decision, a simple idea can be the cornerstone to the triumphant arch that we are going to pass through to freedom. Now, I wasn't accustomed to that kind of language, but my God, that was powerful. A triumphant arch through which I could pass to freedom. I had forfeited all my freedoms. And to you people who are having trouble, let me direct you to something that's oftentimes overlooked in this book. It's another promise. I'll paraphrase it. It's easier for me in my language. It says that if I could think honestly and search diligently within, the consciousness of my belief would be made known to me. And then they put the clincher on it. They said, in this you cannot fail. To this total failure, they said, in this you cannot fail. I say to you people who are having difficulty, in this you cannot fail. It only requires you to think honestly and search diligently, not out there in here, the consciousness of your belief that you don't even know will be made known to you. I was able to make a deal with this borrowed God. We made a contract. It was agreed that God was going to take care of all of the things in my life that he could do better than I could. And I was going to take care of all the things in my life that I could do better than God could. Now, that didn't leave me very much to do, but it was all I was capable of. I was responsible for calling my sponsor at least once a day. I was responsible for getting to the meetings that he suggested and a few little things like that. And under the umbrella of protection of that third step, I was able to take the next two. It was quite a process. Time won't let me share it all in detail with you tonight. I'll just tell you that I simply wrote about five books. I indexed them. I cross-indexed them. I made a glossary. I did, oh boy, I had it in great shape. And I presented it to my sponsor. And he took a couple of looks at it. And he said, when in the hell do you think you will ever come able to follow directions? He was a pretty patient fellow most of the time, but he could be exasperated. He said, of all the steps of the 12, there isn't any that's covered in as great a detail in this book. And we were having to take it with this book. It's all we had at that time. He said, it's a simple outline of cause and effect. Now put your books away and sit down and make an outline. For me, it was simply gathering all the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. And in the fifth step, a combination of his and my loving God, my sponsor and I all sat down and put the pieces of this jigsaw together. And it made a picture. It was me. And I saw for the first time in my life what I had really become. What in the hell I was. Now to all of you people here who have still been looking for the chapter entitled Why instead of How, It has never been written yet in this book, but you can find your answer why when you take a good fifth step. Good God Almighty, I or no one else could have lived to the son of a bitch that I was looking at and stayed sober. 
That's why. And I said, my God, George, what is the matter? This is the first promise that isn't being kept. I have been told how good I would feel when we completed this. He said, patience, Dan. Isn't it nice that they put step six right after step five? I hope you can see that. Isn't it nice that they put step six right after step five? Because you see, I came to you people searching only for one thing. How to get and stay sober. I think my 42 years is pretty good proof that you taught me well. But it's the very least that you did for me. As important as my sobriety is and everything in my life depends on it, it's the very least you did for me. The bottom line in this spiritual awakening, the bottom line in this recovery is freedom, in my belief. And now, for just a minute, I'll ask you to relieve me of the promise that I will only talk to you about what I found in this book, and let me express a personal belief that I have come to know because of myself and the thousands of people I have watched. I believe with all and everything that I have that it is the ultimate need of every one of God's kids to have freedom. The ultimate need, I am sure, every one of us would put here totally free. And because of the devastation of my disease, I had forward, I had lost every freedom I had ever had, forfeited every one. Because I found in that fifth step that I just wasn't in bondage to alcohol, I was in total and complete bondage. I would have bet you the family jewels that the only thing that I was obsessive and compulsive about was mood-altering chemicals, primarily booze. The truth of it was, and it was there in that fifth step, I was obsessive and compulsive about everything in my life. I had never had enough of anything. And if you had what I thought I needed, I took it. And if you got run over in the process, that the hell was your fault. You shouldn't have been there. And if you were in my space and I wanted it, I was there. And you got trampled. In fact, if you, you were in your space and I wanted it, you got trampled. That's the kind of a person this was. And he said to me, are you entirely ready to let go of all of these defects of character? And of course I said, sure, and I thought I was. Perhaps you've experienced the same thing and then found as I did that there's a difference between being willing and ready. I was sure willing, but it took a while to get ready for some of them. But I'll tell you this, I never ever had to starve in order to do something about my gluttony. It was not necessary to castrate me simply because I had the ability to lust. That is not what this loving God had in store for me. You see, I come to find out that I not only had a loving God I found in that fifth step, and I was able to give this one back to God, my sponsor, 
but I found out that this loving God was also my creator and my father. And he had created me just the way he wanted me to be. And I was the one that had screwed it all up. And he had forgiven me everything I had ever done before I did it. And he was willing and able to do for me in the sixth step the things I could not do for myself, just like he did in the first. It only required my permission, as it did in the first. It was suggested to me that perhaps I'd want to continue cleaning up the wreckage of my past. I'm going to come back someday and tell you about a terrible affliction I had when I got here. Some of you may have had it. I had a knot in my gut that wouldn't go away. Anybody here ever experienced that? The reason for that was I had a whole bunch of fish hooks embedded in my gut. And on the other end was someone to whom I owed an amends. And when I presented my list to my sponsor, he said, there's something wrong here, Dan. I took the fifth step with you. This couldn't possibly be your list. But you see, I had misread that eighth step. I had made a list of all the people that I had harmed that I was willing to make amends to. It was a pretty short list. He sent me back to the drawing board. And he said, first of all, we make a list of everything, everyone we owe amends to. And then we have a list to work on to become willing to make amends to them all. And you know, as difficult and as hard as that was, every time I was able to forgive one of those rotten sons of bitches. A fish hook mysteriously was removed from my gut. And there came a day when there was no longer any fish hooks. And I no longer had a knot in my gut. The reward of forgiveness is freedom. Because when that day came, no one, no thing, not anything, had any power any longer over me except that which I gave it. About this time, they reminded me in this book of the promise of the second step. They said, now that your sanity has been restored, it is no longer necessary to fight anyone or anything, not even booze. Another reward, another freedom. And they explained to me that I had this recovery, that I was now recovered 24 hours at a time, contingent upon my daily spiritual health. And the way that I could keep that was to watch for four things every day in my life. And any day that I found any one of those four things creeping back into my life, there were four things that I must do. Now I know you're waiting, some of you, for me to remind you, as you well know, what those four things were and what the four things are you must do. And you've got a long wait because I'm not going to tell you. It's in this book. 
And if you haven't already realized it, this is one of the most sophisticated pyramid book-selling groups that there is in the world. That's what we do here. We sell books. And if you want to learn what those four things are, the four things you must do to keep this beautiful freedom that you now have, buy a book. Buy a book. Get a book. I wish I had time to tell you, but it's nearing, we're about to run out of rental time. I would like to tell you just a little bit about my service. My group sent me to the first convention, conference, that Alcoholics Anonymous ever had in 1950 in Cleveland. And I went there mouthing a lot of things that I had heard the old timers, that was three people with three more years of sobriety than I had, about those people in New York must either be drunk or on the biggest dry drunk yet to be talking about tr such a thing as traditions and service. And I went there mouthing that I was 30, what, 35, 38 years of age, young compared to most of the people there. I was beginning to get well. I had to, beginning to get the gaff to gab back again, and they pounced on me like, oh, oh, boy. And I'm telling you, they didn't let up till they had me turned around. So as I told you, I didn't volunteer for service, I was recruited. I went back and started helping form a committee to make our state a general service. I was invited to the first general service conference in New York as a non-voting member in 1951. I moved to Nevada in 1952. We organized the state eventually. The man in Las Vegas who was, well, let me tell you, <laughs> I'm going to quit in a minute. Uh, I left more recovering alcoholics in my home group when I left Kansas City than was in the state of Nevada where I was going. And I went to Las Vegas, Nevada, and the man there with the, uh, the uh, leading deacon, and he was, uh, had two more years of sobriety. And he wasn't about to listen to anything that I had to say about service. He said, Dan, all we need is an answering service, an ad in the paper, and somebody to tell New York to mind their own goddamn business. There's some of those still around. You've met them. <laughs> but I was patient, and I eventually found a man in Reno that thought as I did. Between the two of us, we organized the state of Nevada. We weren't able to have a conference. We visited every group in the state, the two of us, personally, by car. And I may tell you, there's a lot of sand and jackrabbits between groups in that state at that time. We organized the state. And there had been a lot of criticism because of he and I and what we were doing, and so we decided neither one of us would make ourselves available. At that time, there was a lot of activity at what they call the atomic test site, 90 miles north of Las Vegas. And at that time and place, you could not have a clearance and have them know you were a recovering alcoholic. And so we had those members who were recovering up at the test site, would drive 90 miles down to Las Vegas once a week to a meeting. They were mostly people who had gone from Southern California or somewhere else to work there for the government. And one of the guys was real glib, and he got elected as our first delegate. And the poor man never made it to the conference. I'm sure it was terrible for him. 
but it was a lot more devastating to those of us that had worked so hard to get this thing done. And it just totally, completely tore the whole thing up. It was my good fortune to be able to be, that was in 1955, it was my good fortune in 1955 to be able to go to that conference in St. Louis where I sat and watched the passing of the torch from the founders to the groups of Alcoholics Anonymous. The high point in my AA. I saw Bill Wilson and watched him that day on that stage with all of the people with the exception of Dr. Bob, who had been with him from the beginning, both alcoholic and non-alcoholic. His mother, his wife, and his sponsor was there and had been sober over a year. And the things I watched and saw that day made me know that I had to go back and do whatever it was necessary to do to again form a, con form a general service conference in Nevada. So in 1957, we were ready to send a delegate. And who do you suppose agreed to go and who was elected but the guy that said all New York needs to do is mind their own goddamn business? <laughs> Wait till you hear the rest of the story. The conference began on Sunday. On Monday morning, I had business at the bank. And who do you suppose I met in the parking lot? Our delegate. I said, what in the hell are you doing here, sweet? Didn't mean to say that. And he said, uh, well, Dan, I've never been able to tell anyone. But I have such a terrible fear of flying. I went down there, I got clear out to the plane, and I couldn't board. I just couldn't do it. I feel terrible about it. Well, the group had selected me as the alternate, and on Tuesday morning, I was at the conference. And so that's how I got to be a delegate and didn't get to be a trustee. But I want to say to you service people, You've read and you've heard that the things that those founders and those early people were the most concerned about was whether they had done a sufficient job, whether they had done the job well enough to prepare the next generation to take over. And it wasn't their ego. They were that concerned. You see, in the beginning, they had had visions of a national or maybe international chain of hospitals, and they were going to have speakers touring all the schools. They were going to do all of these things, and none of them came to pass. But when that Saturday Evening Post article came out, and they said in it, every one of your inquiries will be personally answered, and the mail begin to stack up in bags to the ceiling of the room and they didn't have a single paid employee. They didn't even have an office. All they had was a box number. Then they began to see what the tremendous task was one day going to be. Those people were so dedicated that every one of those Inquiries eventually were answered, but they really worried about the passing of the torch. And so again, speaking only for myself, but what I think they would heartily approve of, I would like to tell you that it has been my extreme satisfaction and pleasure to watch this torch pass, torch pass time and again. And I want to say to you people who have been carrying the torch of service, I propose a toast to you. I would like to say to you for all of the people who firmly meant to and didn't get to, thank you. And for all of the people who wanted to and couldn't, 
we love you. And for those members who are no longer here, I think they would want me to say to you, well done. You have passed and you're passing the torch and your success is evident. That conference I went to in Cleveland in 1950, that Sunday afternoon in that ballpark, was unbelievable to me. They said there were 3,000 people there. I think they probably counted shadows, but it looked like 300,000 to me. But what is that compared to the 50,000 in Montreal and the 77,000 they're expecting in Seattle? You have done it well. Well done. And to those of you who are just taking the torch, or those of you who are preparing to one day take the torch, let me say to you, follow the clear example that has been set for you. It has proved itself right. Carry the torch with the dignity and the dedication that it deserves. And if you can just remember that you carry this torch to ensure that the compassionate, understanding, loving hand of Alcoholics Anonymous will always be there whenever, anywhere, any time a hand is ever reaching out for help. God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.